the, the right story elements are brought together, then I know that I've got something and that the draft has found its voice. Um, there's this emotional truth that, that um, is central to the human experience, regardless of whatever time period you're writing about. Welcome to History Through Fiction, the podcast. I'm your host, Colin Mustful, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Thomas Maltman, author of The Nightbirds, Little Wolves, and his newest title, The Land. You have to go into the moment and live that moment with your characters. Thomas Maltman is a historical fiction and mystery writer who teaches in the English department at Normandale Community College in Bloomington, Minnesota. His first novel, The Night Birds, won several national awards, including an Alex Award, a Spur Award, and the Friends of the American Writers Literary Award. His second novel, Little Wolves, was a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award and was named a favorite mystery of 2013 by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Maltman has a Master of Fine Arts degree from Minnesota State University, Mankato. His newest novel, published by Soho Press, is titled The Land. Well, I'd like to begin with your genre. It seems kind of hard to, to tie down. So would you describe it as mystery, uh, historical fiction? I saw also spiritual noir. How would you define your genre? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would say all of those together. <laughs> So history, uh, spiritual noir, and um, yeah, and mystery, and this this element of mystery. Um, I I try and bring all of those together. You know, I thought with my second novel, of course, The Nightbirds, which is um, set in 1876 and 1862, two very distinct time periods in Minnesota history. That is definitely historical fiction. Um, but when I was writing my second novel, um, Little Wolves, it's set in the 1980s during the 1980s farming crisis on the prairies. And so I thought contemporary novel, but I was told by the publisher that technically still makes it historical fiction. Um, I'm just not used to thinking of the 1980s as history. You know, that's like yesterday for me. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say that all three of my novels, including my forthcoming one, which is set in 1999, um, right before the turn of the millennium, um, would be classified under historical fiction. I'm getting closer to the present day, though, gradually and surely. So, and yeah, spiritual noir um, in the sense that I do want to, um, I want to walk with my characters as they experience, you know, some really hard spiritual questions. You know, um, how do we make meaning of suffering? Um, how do we deal with violence? How does a community make sense um, when something evil happens? Um, these are all. Uh, questions that it take place in the story world, but they're also larger questions that I think that we've been also been trying to address as a people too. Mm -hmm. So do you see, you say that in something I read that uh, you write about areas where fiction and history intersect. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely, I, I definitely am looking for those, those uh, stories, you know, that I feel like um, people need to know more about. You know, I'm not from Minnesota originally. I come from Southern California, and I didn't know anything about the Dakota conflict until I was in my late 20s. And um, I was engaged at the time to my wife, um, uh, Melissa, who is who is from Minnesota. And this is where we would end up move, uh, moving and where we've lived in the upper Midwest for the last 20 years. And uh, I picked up a book, an American Girl Dolls book, because I was teaching seventh grade language arts at the time. 
and always looking for books for my classroom library. And in the midst of this American Girl dolls book that was set on the prairie, um, they mentioned the Dakota conflict. And um, it was really a story of friendship, uh, a story of friendship that crosses cultures between the settler community and the Dakota people. And I was completely fascinated by the story. And then I came across the, the story of the mass hangings that took place in Mankato in 1862. And it shocked me. I, I'd, never, I'd, I'd never heard this history before because outside of the state of Minnesota, it is a lost history. Um, the Civil War is happening at the same time. There's so much else that's going on that it's one of those stories that, that tends to get buried. And so, you know, I do want to lift up those moments or those areas in history um, where I, I feel people need to know more about. So did you have a, a similar ign ignition point for um, the little wolves or your newest novel, The Land, that, you know, something that really propelled you toward that story? You know, a, a couple of different things with, with Little Wolves. I, I've been fascinated by small towns and how small towns can become a microcosm. The other thing that I was looking at with um, Little Wolves is I, when I was teaching in the small town, I was told a story um, as a high school teacher there. I was having a problem with a young man who had written this really violent story. And I didn't know what to do with the story. Um, it was so over the top. Um, it's so extreme that I was worried about the young man's mental state. And I went to another teacher and that teacher said, I, I don't know what to do about this young man, but here, let me tell you, let me tell you the story about an, another a town murder that happened um, many years ago. And he went on to tell this story and it, it was a story about uh, a young school teacher. Um, it, they had, had suspended uh, this, this angry young man um, from school. Um, it was on a Saturday, the teacher was down in their basement they heard the doorbell ring. They looked up through the basement window and all they could see was just the, the hem of a coat and some grungy shoes. But something told them, you know, a voice told them, don't go to the door, don't answer the doorbell. And so they didn't go to the door and it was this young man and he had a shotgun tucked inside his coat and he continued on down the street and the sheriff pulled up beside him and he fired through the car door, um, fatally wounding the sheriff and um, then went out into the cornfield um, where he, you know, uh, committed suicide. And it, it was a shocking story, you know, that he told me. Of course, it didn't make me feel any better about the student that I was trying to deal with in the present. Um, but the story stuck with me many years ago uh, and many years later. And then one morning I woke up and I had the voice in my mind. I was new to fatherhood myself. The voice in the, the, my mind of this um, father who's just, his son has just done something terrible. And he has to reckon with what his son has done. And I sat down and I wrote the story um, and it was, I already had this small town story going and I showed my wife the pages and she said, you know, that's the story that you have to tell. Definitely. And that, that and that's just fascinating to, to hear how those, those stories kind of inspire you to, to create these great works of, of fiction. So you, you talked about the U S Dakota war. So I, I'd like to get it a little bit more into that uh, specifically, about your native characters. When I, I read The Nightbirds, I found those characters very compelling and, and from my point of view anyways, very humanizing and realistic. How exactly did you accomplish that? Well, um, we lived right near the Lower Sioux Agency while I was writing The Nightbirds. Um, so I mentioned that I'd come across it and um, was fascinated by the history. I knew that I wanted to write a novel. I didn't know if I had a novel in me or not. Um, and so I had this fascination. And then my wife's first assignment as a Lutheran pastor uh, took us out to the prairies to Morgan, Minnesota, which is really just five miles from the Lower Sioux Agency. And so here I had this fascination with the history. And now we were living right in the same valley where it all took place. And so, um, you know, I really felt like the story was kind of calling to me from out of time. But when, whenever they would host any kind of event that featured native speakers, um, I would go there and I wanted to be part of all of those events and I wanted to hear their stories. Um, and so some of the things, some of the lore that appears in the book are things that Dakota taught me themselves. So at one point, uh, Hazel breaks open this cottonwood branch and on the inside of the cottonwood branch, there is a perfect um, five-sided star. And it was a Dakota elder that showed me that there really is, like if you break open these cottonwood branches, you can really see this, this perfect five-sided star. And that's the reason why the cottonwood are in part sacred uh, for the Dakota people. And so I knew that I wanted to honor 
the Dakota with a story um, to try and tell it in such a balanced, you know, in a balanced way. And so I really, as much as possible, wanted to know and understand the Dakota viewpoint, the Dakota perspectives, um, how they look at it today, um, and the stories that they've they've kept alive over the years. Um, it is a very controversial history, even today, um, incredibly controversial. And so you know you're wading into all of that whenever you're trying to write the story. Um, and you know it, I, you've got to recognize, I feel like, on some level that however you decide to tell the story, not everybody's going to be happy with the way that you tell it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how you expose emotional truths as well th through your writing. That That is a challenge. You know, I, I really think that uh, you have to go into the moment and live that moment with your characters. And, you know, so in the opening uh Opening pages of the novel um, of the Night Birds. It's it opens in 1876 um, as this young man, his aunt has just been released from the insane asylum, and she brings these stories that he's been longing to hear his whole life. His parents refuse to speak about the Dakota conflict. He's always suspected that they played some role in it or that there was some part in it, but they won't tell him the stories. And so his aunt comes from the asylum and she's bringing all these stories that he's longed to hear. Um, but in that first chapter in 1876 in Minnesota, there was this horrible locust plague um, where the, the the farmers were being devastated. the The locusts were, you know, eating, you know, eating their crops whole um, and ravaging um, the countryside. And so I don't know what the, what it's like to to walk across a field of locusts. But the boy does something in that first chapter to anger his father, to disappoint his father. What I do know, Colin, is what it feels like to be the boy who is afraid what, of what is going to happen when dad gets home. When you know some, you've done something that you shouldn't have done and you're going to have to answer to, uh, for it for your father. Um, and so that's an emotion that, that I can tap into um, as an author to project myself back into that moment in history. And, you know, Flannery O'Connor says that most of us by the age of six have experienced a full range of um, full spectrum of emotions from anger to joy, and that you've experienced that full spectrum that you can draw upon for the rest of your life as, as a writer. Well, that's very well said and, and very helpful for, for writers out there. Uh, listening to, to some interviews you've done, you seem to put a lot of value in fiction and what fiction can do. For those who haven't heard, uh, what you said uh, about the value of fiction. Can you articulate that now? Yeah. So the, the value of fiction, I, I think, is it keeps the stories alive. And uh, um, we talked earlier about that uh, Civil War uh, professor who showed up in regalia and told stories from the Civil War and how he held this audience of reluctant high school students. You know, they, they were fascinated with the stories that he had to tell. And so it can bring... Uh, a reader, an audience into a history that they might not know about otherwise, and and so um, th that's my ultimate goal of hope. I don't I don't want people to read the Night Birds or or any work of fiction um, expecting that it's that it's exactly how things happen in history. But what I would hope is that reading a novel like this would get would trigger an interest and get them reading about you know the history, the nonfiction, um, great books like Through Dakota Eyes. Um, and that's, that's part of my hope is that the, the novel keeps the stories alive and also triggers this interest in history so that people want to read and want to know more. Definitely. So what is your process then once you discover a story from learning the history to then changing it into a narrative to developing your characters? How does that work? I would definitely say that a big part of my process is I'm a big believer in going there and seeing the places that um, are featured in the history. That if you can go there and you can walk that ground, um, you're gonna connect with the characters and with the time period in a way that you that you can't just through books alone. And so, you know, with the Nightbirds, for instance, I went around and traveled um, it, to New Ulm and, and to um, places at the Lower Sioux Agency, and I always wanted to see their archives. And if you can go through the archives, you can uh, touch journals or diaries written by the settlers themselves, um, see maps of things that are, that are lost. And you can understand history 
in a way that you that, that you can't just through books alone. So definitely going there and seeing the places, you know, um, we mentioned uh, here on the north side of Twin Cities, um, you can go up to Elk River and um, Elk River has a historical farm and you can do things like drive a plow behind an ox um, and it, you can have that physical tactile experience and that helps you write about it so that the writing itself is, you know, more authentic to the time that you're trying um, to write about because people thought differently back then. They Their thought processes, the way they lived um, were different from how we understand things now. And so you have to you have to experience some of that by definitely going to the places in person and seeing it. So did you head up to northern Minnesota before writing the land and and, and what kind of I know it's about a spiritual community up there. Did you have any interactions with those kinds of smaller communities? No, you know, the land in part, you know, I, I feel like we have this fascination with the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of escape as a place of danger. Um, that's part of our American psyche. And that's part of what I wanted to explore. And so when I wrote The Land, I wanted to set it in the, the, the wildest place that I knew um, in Minnesota, which is that Arrowhead region. And, uh, you know, so in that case, I'm not writing about an actual history. And in fact, some of the things that mentioned that are mentioned in um, The Land um, didn't take place in the Arrowhead region. There wasn't, um, he, this young man in the land, he has to investigate. Uh, there's this woman he's been involved with, and he suspects that the people who are a part of this white supremacist church, um, it's called a Christian identity church. And there are these churches right here in Minnesota. Um, sad to say, um, we like to think of racism and things like that being down south or other places, but they're right here in Minnesota. And so, um, so he has to go and investigate this church because he feels like they played some role in her disappearance. He doesn't know whether she's living or dead, whether she's run away or if something bad has happened to her. And so it's a story about what happens to him and what he uncovers. Um, but there are a lot of things that, that went into the making of that novel. I lived in Spokane in the mid-1990s um, when you had the Ruby Ridge incident going on where the feds tried to go in um, to the Weaver compound and it caused, you know, this, this, um, this episode of violence. Um, and so, you know, I was living right there in the, the inland Northwest when this was, was happening, watching, um, watching what our society was trying to do as they struggled with how do you respond to these white supremacist groups. And so that was very much part of in my mind when I wrote the story. But as I did research, Colin, because it wasn't originally, that novel was not originally set in, in Minnesota. Um, as I did research, though, the, the ties kept pointing me back toward the upper Midwest. Um, Randy Weaver and his wife, you know, they were married in Fort Dodge, Iowa. There was a Christian identity church right down in Fridley, Minnesota, just, you know, just directly south of me. Um, there was a, a, public, a publisher of um, some of this really bad white supremacist material, he operated out of his basement in Apple Valley, Minnesota. And so all of the signs, you know, kept pointing me back toward right where I was at. And I realized that, you know, we like to think of racism and, and these kinds of things as happening somewhere else. And of course, as I'm saying this, and as we're doing this podcast, you know, I, another, there was another man um, today who was just killed by police, um, a person of color, um, that we're dealing with right here in our communities. And so when I was writing that novel, I realized I had to bring it home. I had to bring it home to Minnesota. And so I set it in the wild, wildest place that I knew in Minnesota, um, in that Arrowhead region. Well, it's very interesting what you, you find out when, you know, you, you seek these stories and speaking as a Minnesotan myself, I didn't know about any of those things that you just, just talked about. And I also, didn't know about the U.S. Dakota War or the Dakota 38 until I went to school in Mankato. I believe we both went to Minnesota State Mankato. Oh, wow. And, you know, I, I found the the statue of the Buffalo in Reconciliation Park, and that's how I found out about it. Oh, wow. So it seems kind of maybe an unintended consequence of these novels is, you know, you get to know the characters, but you also get to know some some real facts that, that otherwise are obscured. Right. Right. And, and that's, that is, is something that, you know, once you know those facts, then, 
what do you do with them? You know, I, I really do think that you have to try and lift those those facts up or bring the stories to a, you know a wider wider audience. You know, mm-hmm. um, that that's that's your goal. So tell me more about the setting. You said you were, you felt compelled to change it to the upper Midwest, and I know your other novels are set in the Midwest. Uh, why do you think that is? That's that's a really good question. Um, you know, because I am from um, the West originally, but you know, my my father was a military man, um, so we moved around quite a bit uh, growing up, and wherever we went, my, my dad wanted us to get to know the local lore of the places where we were living to understand that, that, that particular place. And so I, I guess I, you know, from a young, from a young age, I've had a fascination with place and with the stories um, that go with particular places. And so that's, that's part of what draws me in, you know, there are little bits and little stories that got woven into the Nightbirds, for instance, you know, that came up, that came from the archives directly um, if I could just mention one of them briefly, uh, in the New Ulm archives, I came across the story of um, a man who's trying to escape. Um, well, it was a farmer in at the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century. He's wandering his grove, and he looks down inside of the hollow trunk of this tree. And inside of the hollow trunk of this tree, he finds a skeleton. And they unearth the skeleton, and they, they uh, discover that the based on the paperwork on the skeleton, that this person had crawled down inside of the stump uh, to try and escape from the Dakota and got stuck inside the, the stump and, you know, basically starved inside of that, that hollow tree. And so there's so much great symbolism um, behind that, um, so much great imagery that when you come across a, a little story like that as, as an author, uh, you, you know you've got to work with it, right? You've got you to find a way to, to weave that in. And so little bits and stories like that get woven up or absorbed into the text that you're writing. In the meantime, in the meantime, Colin, you know, as there are things happening in your own life that also get caught up into um, the story itself. Even though you're writing in the past, I really think that as authors, what's happening in our own lives um, is is going to be caught up if, you know, should be caught up in the fiction itself too. So how much of your writing do you say you completely fictionalized for the purpose of, of, of intertwining the narrative or, or, or making the narrative, you know, fit and how much of it is based on those stories and those facts that you've come across? You know, and I, I've read different things on this, you know, there are authors who say that your ultimate loyalty is to the world of your characters, um, to your characters in the story world that, that you have created. Um, and I, there's a quote that I love, um, from Jessamyn West uh, that I think I, I've cited before. And, and the, this quote from Jessamyn West says that fiction reveals truths that reality obscures. So fiction reveals truths that reality obscures. And I, I love that quote because it, it just gets at that idea that that what fiction can do is an expose an emotional truth. Um, there's this emotional truth that, that um, is central to the human experience regardless of whatever time period you're writing about. And that's the ultimate uh, goal that you're going to lift up. And I, I would say it really depends in terms of the history that you're writing about. I think that I tried to be much more careful with the Dakota conflict because of the various controversies um, that continue to this day um, about that, that history um, that I wanted. I didn't want to change the actual facts um, to fit you know, timelines or things like that. Um, that I, I wanted to stay as true as possible, as true as possible, even though it's a work of fiction, um, to some of the incidents that actually happened in history. Um, and so I guess I fall in, in different ways. You know, I, I would say that um, Little Wolves is less a historical novel. It's less about the 1980s farming crisis than it is about um, the, this kind of allegory of a small town and how it, us community deals with 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 evil um, when something bad happens, um, you know. And so, it, and then you know, 
the novel that I, the land again is is not so much about actual history as it is about the struggle with white supremacy um this this struggle with with what we do as a community um when such groups um occur in our, our communities how do we deal with that um and so it really varies based upon the work that that i'm working on um and if i could just say one more thing just really briefly one of my novels that hasn't found a publisher yet that i've um that i've struggled with is on the french revolution and um in that case there um I wildly deviated from, um, you know, French Revolution history. Uh, when I went to Paris many years ago and toured Notre Dame, the gargoyles, um, I remember looking up at Notre Dame and, and the rain was coming down and it looked like the gargoyles were drooling in the rain. And I did this, it had this image of these creatures being alive. And the, the idea that they would put these things on a church just fascinated me. And so I had this idea, you know, what would the French Revolution be like if the gargoyles were living creatures? And so I wrote the French Revolution with this element of magical realism, poured about three years of my life into that novel, Colin, and it still hasn't found a publisher yet, um, and in part because I, I think that it, it's on this kind of, you know, publishers are a little bit uncertain, you know, is this historical fiction? Um, is this uh, magical realism? And because they can't quite pigeonhole it, um, I've been struggling with that one to find a place for it. So that's a long-winded answer to say that it really varies uh, based on the history. But with the Nightbirds, I definitely did try to, to be as faithful as possible to the histories that I uncovered and learned about. Well, it sounds like quite a, a fun story, and I'm sure you'll find a home for it eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that- that kind of leads me into uh, some more practical questions about about writing. Um, in, a, in an earlier interview I listened to, you talked about having to do several drafts and being a bit of a slow writer. Uh, so have you improved your pace at all? It sounds like, you know, three <laughs> years is kind of short for you. <laughs> uh, uh, I, wish, I wish that I could um, write uh, more quickly. Uh, you know, I, I really do think that for me, um, I, a novel kind of is, is a little bit like an, an onion. It has all of these layers um, that it, if it has all these layers and complexity um, for me, that that process of accretion takes years, takes years to build up um, and it takes several drafts. And each draft that I write is wildly different um, from the draft that came before. You know, it's like this novel, The Land. Um, that's coming out in October that we we're talking about that's set in the Arrowhead region. When I first started writing that novel, I had it set back in 1850. And it was, um, there was this group called the Millerites that thought that the world was gonna come to an end. And that's what I was writing about it in the very beginning. Um, and so, you know, each draft I think is, is widely different. Um, I keep writing, I write the draft from start to finish. And I know when I've come across it, uh, when, when I reach the, when the, the right story elements are brought together, then I know that I've got something and that the draft has found its voice. And so you hear novel novelists talk about how they have like their first two novels are down in the basement, um, buried somewhere. And I feel like everything that I've written, you know, has gone on to find a publisher so far, but mostly because I, you know, I try and go back and I rewrite each one of these drafts and these drafts are so, so very, very, very different from um, the draft before, um, you know, that, that eventually if I'm faithful to the process, I'm going to get the story right. And I just have to have to trust in that process, but it, it does take years for me um, to, to write a story. So do you do you work with an a, the, a consistent agent the whole time, or or do you have to requery every every time? I have an agent, L Laura Langley, um, and I picked up uh, Laura Langley as my agent with my second book, and my second book it was had already been accepted at the time by Soho Press, and then you know I was querying uh, Laura at the time, and I said I've I've got an offer on the table, um, do you want to be part of this? And then um, so. That's how Laura became my agent. It does help, I think, to have an agent. Um, you know, we need friends as writers. This idea of the solitary writer alone in the tower. Um, no, you need to be connected to a community. Maybe when you're writing it, you need to be alone in that tower. 
But ultimately, to survive as writers, we need to be connected to a broader community. And so I do think it helps having an agent. They can open doorways for you um, at different publishing houses. Um, but anytime you can get a friend in your corner, um, that's that's always going to be of a help to you. And so, yeah, Laura's been with me since. Um, and uh, she's she's been a good agent. And um, But my press for all three of my novels so far has, has been the same. Uh, Soho Press, um, they normally do international murder mysteries. That's their 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 main bread and butter, but they just happen to publish on the side a, a few um, literary novels that deal with cultural conflict. And so I just kind of fit this little niche of what they did. And that's how I ended up um, with Soho Press. Are you working on anything new right now or do you just have any some ideas sparking? Um, I have some ideas sparking and I, I wrote a novel when the pandemic started and uh, I, it's, it's a novel that's a little bit different from uh, what I've written before. Um, it's, a, it's partly about the Kensington, Kensington Stone in Alexandria. You know, here's again, one of those little lost histories. Um, is it real or is it fake? You know, um, to this day, there are different experts who debate on, on both sides. Um, so this farmer, if, if um, listeners haven't heard the story, um, this farmer found this stone with runes carved on it in the grips of an aspen tree on his farm and, um, you know, turned it into the local history. People said it was a, you know, called him a fraud or a fake um, and all of these other things. But, but the, the stone itself tells the story of Vikings finding America 100 years before Columbus and stumbling around on the prairies. And um, again, that's one of those little histories that is it real or not? Is it true? Um, the, where that line between fairy tale and fact um, that, that really fascinates me as a writer. And so I wanted to write about that. And uh, then I uh, mentioned that I'm married to a Lutheran pastor. Um, one year, uh, my wife's first year out on the prairie, um, she didn't have any of the ashes. They hadn't arrived by... Um, by card catalog, normally they come in this this big bag from like Texas, a bag of ashes for the Ash Wednesday service. And so we had to make the ashes um, that year um, and burned up palm leaves in the garage there. And I had to use um, a little bit more lighter fluid than necessary. And I just remember that that year, the ashes that were marked upon people's foreheads didn't quite wash off right away, you know? And uh, so I had this idea, like what would happen in a small community um, if the ashes didn't wash away? Would it change how people looked at one another, how they saw one another, how they behaved toward one another? And so those two ideas um, kind of got uh, caught, brought together in the um, draft that I just wrote. It's called Ashes to Ashes. Um, and, it, and so it's a novel that brings together um, this small town and um, what happens after one Ash Wednesday service and the Vikings on the prairie. Um, so I, I really do think that uh, that it's like the these two stones that you bring together, you bring together two stones and they start to make sparks. And that's part of what I'm doing so much with any kind of novel or story, Colin, is I'm trying to bring together two rocks and hoping it makes sparks or fire um, for the reader. Well, I applaud your creativity and it sounds like you will never be lacking inspiration. I hope not. <laughs> So and that's a good thing, too, about um, writing programs or write, finding writing communities, you know, is I, I thought maybe I only had one story to tell. But, you know, if as you go and you take classes, you know, and, and you meet other writers and connect with other writers, what I hope that people find is that maybe you find that you have many stories that are caught up inside you that you need to tell. Definitely. Well, I've been talking with Thomas Maltman, author of the novels The Nightbirds, Little Wolves, and his newest title, The Land. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Colin. I really appreciate your time, and I really appreciate the invitation. It's good to meet you. 
Thank you. Tom, I'm going to pause here just for just a second. Are you having trouble with your mic? You're kind of going in and out a little bit. Um, I, I'm not having trouble with the mic. Um, I think that I, the screen signed me out for just a second there. Uh -huh. um, so if I don't press the mouse, then the screen um, signs me out a little bit too. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, yeah, just try to limit whatever movement that was or, or something like that. Because for, you're, you're loud and then you're quiet and then loud again. It's something <laughs> I can, I should be able to fix in uh, post-production. But Sure, sure. And I do have a microphone that I can hook up to this. It's just not right um, available. Let me see if I can find it. Um, and I was moving around a little bit. Um, let's see. I Oh, it's buried underneath here, Colin. So so if you can hear me just fine, I'll just try and stay still and won't move around as much. Okay. Okay. 